West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Let's take these pieces apart one by one, because there's a lot I want to ask you about. First, the raid this morning on Rudy Giuliani's home. So this raid is um, very noteworthy, obviously, because of the flip flop, so to speak, by the Justice Department. But this is really the financial side of the impeachment inquiry, uh, which was the political side. And we were aware of some of these financial shenanigans going on with Giuliani and Tensing and Geneva, but it was just well beyond anything that uh, we were focused on. And the Southern District, however, has been focused on it. And this dovetails a little bit with their case against Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman. The, the interesting news to me is we've heard a lot about Giuliani and search warrants. Um, but we, this is the search warrant of Victoria Tensing is particularly noteworthy because there was a retainer agreement between Tensing and corrupt Ukrainian officials for, for the corrupt Ukrainian officials to pay Tensing to effectively do what Giuliani was trying to do related to Ukraine, which was to essentially dig up dirt on Joe Biden. So I, I think it's all coming to a head now, and we're seeing the final steps of a, a financial investigation that is the, the sort of parallel track to the political investigation that we did as part of the impeachment inquiry. And the, there are other players who were all refreshing our collective memories, um, names like Lev Parnas, but also questions about Bill Barr. I want to reread this line in The New York Times report. The New York Times reports that senior Justice Department officials had not greenlit investigators' efforts to get this warrant. Uh, Lisa Monaco has been confirmed for all of eight days. Merrick Garland, obviously, a little longer. What does that say to you, Dan Goldman, about what was perhaps being squashed at the highest levels of the Justice Department? Well, there was reporting uh, several months ago that email search warrants were being squashed by Bill Barr, ostensibly because of this 60 day rule, which, Nicole, you'll probably remember Bill Barr frowned upon in his public testimony. Um, but even after that, uh, after the election, uh, Bill Barr tried to to squash it. Um, so now we have a new uh, administration who's going by the book. And if there's evidence of a crime, um, and you go through all the proper protocols, given that Giuliani is an attorney, um, then you get a search warrant. But I will say one other thing, Nicole. I, I don't think this is the first search warrant that the Southern District uh, would have obtained in this case. My guess is that they already have obtained an email search warrant for Giuliani's emails, which is what was being reported earlier. 
they could have used the fruits of that search warrant as probable cause to get into his apartment and his office. But it is likely, and we would not know about this unless it was reported, it's quite likely that they got emails uh, from the service providers of Giuliani's email accounts uh, already. And Pete Strzok, it seems possible that they also, because Lev Parnas is now cooperating, may have his end of his communications with Rudy Giuliani. Pete, let, let me just play for all of you part of Lev Parnas describing the close collaboration among all the players we've talked about. Let's watch. Do you know if Mr. Giuliani was ever in contact with Mr. Barr specifically about the fact that he was trying to get Ukraine to announce these investigations into Joe Biden? Oh, absolutely. That Mr. Would... Barr knew about that. Mr. Barr had to have known everything. I mean, it's impossible. Did Rudy Giuliani tell you he'd spoken to the Attorney General specifically about Ukraine? Not only Rudy Giuliani. I mean, Victoria and Joe, are, they were all best friends. I mean, Barr, uh, Barr was, uh, Attorney General Barr was basically on the team. So, Pete, I'm going to read this one more time. United States Attorney's Office in Manhattan and the FBI had sought for months to secure search warrants for Mr. Giuliani's phones and electronic devices. Quote, under Mr. Trump, senior political appointees in the Justice Department repeatedly sought to block such a warrant. What do you think the FBI agents were trying to learn? And, and where do you think the investigation had taken them? Well, I think the investigation took them to the point where they needed to see as best they could the original communications between Giuliani and others. Typically, Dan's absolutely right. You build up from the ground, and that frequently involves things like subpoenas for financial records. I, too, agree that it's quite likely that there were prior search warrants for email providers. And all these go along, particularly when you're looking at attorneys, you want to use the least intrusive means because there is a higher standard to get a search warrant uh, for an attorney. But the fact of the matter is what these search warrants show is that a judge found that there was probable cause that there's evidence of a crime at these locations. And again, my understanding from the reporting coming out just recently just recently is that was Giuliani's home, his office at a separate location, and then at least for Tinsig's phone, and at least recently Tinsig's camp has made some indication that they were looking for communications between her and John Solomon, a reporter who used to work for The Hill, who published a great deal of information, disinformation actually, about Ukraine. And so it tells me that investigators at the point, and actually last summer, were at the point where they were ready to get this information had problem cause to get this information and had to sit and wait essentially for a year until they were able to get a hold of it. It is Thursday, the 29th of April of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life, indeed. You know, the best shrimp and grits I, I ever had was in New Orleans, and they uh, actually tweaked the old Charleston recipe to make it, well, you know, sort of jambalaya. <laughs> and indeed they did. And uh, since we're speaking of Louisiana, it kind of reminds me, I wanted to mention about this idiot in uh, the Louisiana legislature who, who insisted that if you're going to teach, you know, this liberal agenda, you're going to give some of us, uh, you know, a little bit of history, too. And he insisted that both sides of slavery has to be taught, the good side and the bad. If you're going to teach the bad side of slavery, you got to teach the good side. The good side of slavery. I guess what he means is that the good side of slavery is when you're the plantation owner and you own the slaves. Which is, uh, I don't know, I always thought that was just a nice way of calling you a racist mofo. Owning slaves. I'm a slave owner. Oh yeah, plantation owner. Oh, you're a racist mofo? Jeez. And they just come right out and say it. The liberal agenda, yes, caring for another human being. You know, that's not in the prosperity gospel. Love thy neighbor? <laughs> that's a sin in the prosperity gospel. Jeez. No wonder they think that uh, they need to eradicate us. We just care too much. Which means we're a bunch of losers. Yeah, so, uh, Joe, uh, I, I, I thought Joe was rather exciting. Now, Fox and the others are saying, oh, he put me to sleep. Ted Cruz is like going to sleep during a 
appearance by the President of the United States in a joint uh, session of Congress. You know, the senators and the House. Because it's not a State of the Union yet. But, uh, you know, the State of the Union is a lot better than it was even a year ago. Jeez. A year ago. Think of that. We were... Uh, put into this position where states had to hide ventilators and other medical equipment from the Trump administration because they were j- literally jacking the trucks and stealing the equipment. All right. But Joe, oh, yeah, he's a socialist. Well, you know what? If he is, it's better than the mobster that we had for four years. And thank God. Their mob lawyers getting run through the ringer because they're going after Rudy. That's not the pinnacle of their investigation, trust me. (laughs) No, they get lower hanging fruit and work their way up. So uh, no wonder they tried to, well, violently overthrow an election right at the time it was to be certified in Congress. Because they knew an investigation was already going on. Uh huh. Or suspected. But I think they knew because when you uh, hold the levers of power, <laughs> like these mobsters did, uh, they knew. All right. And that's why they scrambled to replace people throughout uh, the. You know, the U.S. attorney's offices, uh, various uh, Justice Department uh, uh, people were replaced with uh, Quislings. They scrambled. And some of those are still embedded. And when they're found out, well, yeah, you know, they're going to be put into a broom closet. Why wouldn't they be? Jesus, they're there to muck it all up. Anyway, uh, they did get a couple of judges in the Supreme Court. Under duplicious ways, you know, the fruits of a crime, usually my experience, well, not my personal experience, but my experience in how these judicial matters happen in America is that for, geez, the last 40 plus years, there's been this thing called civil asset forfeiture. If the fruits of a crime have been used to further more crimes, you then, then the property that was gained from the fruits of that crime. That's the fruit of the crime. They've committed a crime. And so they have to seize that property so it will stop committing crimes. So now we have two sitting justices, well, at least two, but, you know, Amy and Brett. We could get Gorsuch in there, too, but we'll just put him aside just for a moment. Okay. Um, We got Amy. We have Brett. They are the fruits of a crime. And if there was ever an example of an asset committing crimes that need to be seized and put into escrow... Actually, they just they don't even put it in escrow. They hold it some in some fashion. And then if you have been proven innocent of the charges, just try getting your assets back. They don't make it easy. <laughs> so why is it that this whole mob government that we just kicked out, who violently tried to overthrow an election on the day it was to be certified, Why is it that the assets acquired that are now fruits of a crime that continue to commit a crime? Why are they not seized? So is the only solution an expansion of the court? Is the only solution is adding more states? Well, I think that should happen anyway. But let's not even get into the Joe Manchin story. My God. I don't know. I, I, I think he's got a little latent, uh, you know, uh, bigotry going on there. Oh, please. I know he's a progressive of a type. 
<laughs> He's not progressive. Only that, yeah, you know, there were a lot of guys that uh, had rednecks. And the reason they were called rednecks is because they were union types. Okay, let's that's the original term for redneck. They always appropriate this stuff. But anyway, uh, I think that uh, Joe's a little too, uh, this big mansion, a little too uh, buddy-buddy with the seditious caucus, the insurgent caucus. Well, it's a little too buddy-buddy for my taste. And when he says, oh, well, you know, I'm just doing what the 370 people in my little neck of the woods here in West Virginia think. Well, you know what? Part of being a leader is telling people when they're wrong. If your constituents are racist, then isn't it your job to make them not racist? If you are a part of the party that is trying to, uh, you know, mitigate this terrible sin on our nation. Part of that is acknowledging the sin. And I'm looking at you, Tim Scott. His rebuttal is that there's, there's, there's no racism in America. None whatsoever. Look, look at me. Look at all these people. Look at all these great people. You know, LeBron James. Look at LeBron. How can there be racism? Yeah. Well, I like to bring up the Jolly Green Giant story, you know, uh, all these little green people. I don't mean Vlad's little green men. I'm talking about little green people. They're everywhere. And, you know, it's just, it's like we got used to all of these people from all over the different parts of the world being rammed down our throats. And now they're trying to ram little green people down our throats. Oh. <sighs> And then people who are for the advancement uh, of little green people would like to advance the civil rights and humanities of little green people. And, of course, all these bigots and racists who just still aren't used to black and brown people being rammed down their throats. Now they have to have little green people rammed down their throats. And it's just no. And so the uh, president of the White Citizens Council approaches uh, the president of the National Association for the Advancement of Little Green People, and they have a debate. And the leader of the National Advancement of the Little Green People says that little green people are being treated so terribly. And the White Citizens Council guy goes, look, <laughs> I mean, how can you say that? Look at the jolly green giant. He's made it. And the head of the National Association of the Advancement of Little Green People says, yeah, we're not, talk we're not talking about celebrities here or sports stars. We're talking about, you know, like the average, common, little green person. And then the debate devolves into, well, charges of socialism and uh, things being thrown back and forth in a rhetorical way until, I don't know. In today's new a go go world, I guess what would happen is that the White Citizens Council guy was going to beat the little green, uh, the advancement for the little, uh, advancement of little green people leader over the head with, I don't know, a Blue Lives Matter flag. Maybe. Or a Green Lives Matter flag. Little green people lives matter flag. They don't care. I only mention that story because these people are off their rockers. They couldn't show even one wit of humanity last night at Joe's speech. Mocking him by falling asleep. Marsha Blackburn just continually typing on her phone. Lo Lauren Berbert throwing, uh, I don't know, shooting, shooting. Her, her eyes were like shooting bolts of whatever, bolts. She hated it. Oh, and then she tweeted later, I miss Donald Trump. I miss President Trump. Sure you do. He's a hateful hate monger. Joe says that, uh, you know, little kids uh, should be able to eat. And, you know, they didn't boo. <laughs> let them die. You know, that's how they would normally respond, I have to say, during the last four years. Just let them die. Don't be so nice to these little kids when you're putting them in the car. Let their heads hit the top of the thing. Yeah, that's how they were. Cruelty is the point. Americans should be able to have clean water. Sat on their hands. No, we want people dead or uh, maimed from lead poisoning. Maimed? Well, you know, debilitated. 
drastically debilitated by lead. They don't care. Cruelty is the point. There is no love thy neighbor in the prosperity gospel. And since it's in the Bible that America is supposed to be that shining city on the hill, <laughs> this is what they think. They believe it. The diner patrons get interviewed and they say it's in the Bible that America should be the city on the hill. What? <laughs> Jesus. Can we have a separation of church and stupidity at least? I mean, <laughs> stupid people from church should not be able to, I don't know, espouse their BS in the public square. Okay? That's what a church is for. Keep them in there. All right? There's no place for that stuff in a rational society. So, Glenn Greenwald came out. I mentioned Tim Scott. Glenn Greenwald came out this morning and said that this, I, I guess, uh, Uncle Tim was trending on uh, Twitter during Tim Scott's uh, rebuttal to everything rational and sane. <laughs> And uh, according to Glenn, that's like, oh, the most racist term that could ever be leveled against anybody. It's what they're the block. Well, oh, I need to remind you. <laughs> Uncle Tom was kind of attributed to other black people by black people. So I'm just leaving it there. And I know for a fact Tim Scott has nieces and nephews. So how dare you, Glenn? But Glenn's a Nazi. And uh, he's proving it more and more. What's up with that guy? Yeah, well, we all know what's up. All right. Liberal democracies need to be destroyed. They need they they must be because I don't know. The world liberal causes uh, them to be triggered. Who gets triggered by liberal? Yeah. Nazis. All right, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speaky as we start off on this fabulous Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays? Well, uh, yeah, some uh, former U.S. attorneys and a few prosecutors indeed have said that uh, they don't think that uh, this is the first search warrant that the Southern District of New York has obtained in the Giuliani case. Not the first one. On the rest of the menu, the Texas GOP official suing Biden over aid to black farmers has a history of hateful comments. Yeah, he is a bigot racist, too. What do you expect? The first woman of color to lead the U.S. Security's Watchdogs Enforcement Division resigned after only five days on the job due to potential conflicts of interest. Yeah, she defended big oil. That might be a big conflict. And the U.S. Labor Board said a retail union's evidence in this month's Amazon vote in Alabama could be grounds for overturning the vote. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where several former members of the Italian Red Brigades were arrested in France. You remember the Red Brigades? Yeah, back there during uh, the 70s and 80s. And a Greek extreme right lawmaker who fled a 13-year prison sentence is being held in Brussels while awaiting an extradition ruling. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com. To the right of the page is that chat room link, and that chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com is that link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroos Radio, your generosity allows us to fulfill our civic duty. And what is that? Well, it's resistance broadcasting, which we have been doing for the last 10 years. This is our 10th year of continuous 24-7, 365 resistance broadcasting. And we've been able to do it because of folks like you who, in their generosity, have, uh, well, what they would spend on a, on a espresso type coffee drink. They send those funds to us once a month, and some people have actually increased that patronage, and we thank you tremendously for doing so. But uh, they send those funds to us once a month, and then we uh, put that uh, into paying our bills. You know, we do pull out a lot of money out of our own wallets because that's what we have to do. Because this is, after all, a civic duty, isn't it? Yes, it is. And so... Your generosity allows us then to fly under the radar when we pay our bills. And then we continue with what we've been doing for the last 10 years as the founders originally intended. I knew I would get through it. And so did you. (laughs) Anyway, all kidding aside, uh, we do thank you for your generosity because we do take this quite seriously, even though we, uh, you know, we affect a jocular tone. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that and a whole lot more. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on daily because about 10 minutes before showtime. I try to at least. And uh, then I uh, that way you can see what the show notes and links are because the show notes... Uh, links up to the actual reported. So that gets linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms, and you know who they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, Tune, and iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. And wherever podcasts can be found. Yeah. Alrighty. You know, it was rather lovely hearing Joe speak last night. He is calming. Now, people like Stephen Miller at grates on him. Humanity really bothers a certain segment of society, and Stephen Miller is one of them. And what is that segment of society? I'd call them the Nazis. Caring for people? What a loser. (laughs) All right. Well, I suppose, you know, the world or the universe gave us this duality. Are we really uh, limited to just dualities? Well, for now, it works in keeping us, well, from uh, patching uh, potholes in the street, repairing bridges, let alone building ones. Jeez, caring for people? That's not in the prosperity gospel. Speaking of prosperity gospel, you know this guy, Sid, whatever his face is. Let's see what his face is. Uh, Yeah, Sid Miller out of Texas. He looks like the Posner character in Billy Jack, you know? The one that gets, uh, you know, a little bit of the foot right against the side of the face because Billy Jack's good with his feet. Oliver Willis brings us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Republican Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller filed a suit in federal court alleging that the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan discriminates against white farmers and ranches. Miller objects to a provision in the law that provides relief to socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. The U.S. Department of Ag defines the terms as individuals who have been subjected to racial or ethnic prejudices because of their identity as a member of a group without regard to their individual qualities. In the suit, which he filed in a personal capacity and not on behalf of Texas, Miller complains that the definition does not include white ethnic groups that have unquestionably suffered due to their ethnicity. Miller's case is backed by America First Legal, 
the group created and run by former Trump senior advisor Stephen Miller, who has a documented history of affiliations with white supremacists. I would say so much so that he's known as Santa Monica Goebbels Stephen Miller. Sid Miller, who served in the Texas House of Representatives from 2001 to 2013, losing a seat in a Republican primary and then running for Ag Commissioner in 2014, has a history of racist, bigoted, and sexist comments. In 2015, the Texas Miller shared a photo on his Facebook page of an atomic bomb mushroom cloud with the caption, Japan has been at peace with the U.S. since August 9, 1945. It's time we made peace with the Muslim world. Wow, that's rather inflammatory. Literally. The post stayed up a few days until it attracted negative media attention. But even after it was taken down, Miller's office did not express regret over it. His campaign spokesman, Todd Smith, told the Texas Tribune, We're not going to apologize for the posts that show up on our Facebook page. In 2019, Miller called on Austin, Texas Mayor Steve Adler to decline an invitation to attend an iftar dinner, the main meal of a Ramadan fast day, with Minnesota Democratic Rep Ilhan Omar with his office releasing a statement that read, Texas Commissioner of Agriculture Sid Miller today said he was shocked to learn that Austin's Jewish mayor, Steve Adler, plans to share the stage in an upcoming Ramadan dinner with controversial Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Adler rejected Miller's demands, noting, The iftar is a time for reflection, piety, and growing closer to God. Every every year, this event is a special opportunity for people of many faiths to grow together. As mayor, it is my privilege and responsibility to lean into such learning moments with my community, not to back away from them. Well, while supporting Trump's campaign in 2016, Miller referred to Hillary Clinton using the misogynistic slur. It was a C word, and it ends in UNT. Miller blamed the posts on Twitter on a hacker and then later on a staffer because they don't care. In 2017, Miller posted a story on his Facebook page alleging that a group of hunters had been attacked by Mexican immigrants at their campsite. In a comment posted along the story, Miller endorsed Trump's border wall. But the story was false. The sheriff's department that investigated the claim found that the injuries that had occurred were due to an incident of friendly fire among the men. And in a rare moment of, well, succumbing to the Christmas holidays, Miller tweeted in 2015, If one more person says happy holidays to me, I just might slap them. Either tell me Merry Christmas, or just don't say anything. I should mention that uh, patronizing accents are wholly the responsibility of the patronizing accenter. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, this next offering is brought to us by Katanga Johnson and Chris Prentice out of Reuters. Alex O., who last week became the first woman of color to lead the U.S. Securities Watchdogs Enforcement Division, resigned yesterday, Wednesday, due to potential conflicts of interest created by her previous work as a lawyer, according to the agency and a person with direct knowledge of the matter. The unusual turn of events is a blow for new Securities and Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler, for whom O was among his first big hires, and underscores the challenges of filling top agency roles with Wall Street defense attorneys. 
In a resignation letter to Gensler yesterday, Wednesday, shared with reporters, O said a, quote, development, end quote, relating to one of her previous cases would be an unwelcome distraction to the important work of the division, end quote. The issue at hand relates to O's work defending ExxonMobil against a lawsuit in her previous role as partner at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, according to a person familiar with the matter. The SEC is probing ExxonMobil over asset valuations issues, and the matter could create a potential conflict of interest if Oda were, were to remain in the role. This issue came to the attention of SEC officials this week, one of the persons involved in the matter said. O previously served as co-leader of Paul Weiss's anti-corruption team. During her 17 years at the firm, she worked for a slew of corporations and Fortune 100 companies. O decided to resign after U.S. District Judge Royce Lamberth, in a Monday order, raised questions over her conduct during a deposition in the Exxon case, according to the order and the person with knowledge of the matter. Brad Karp, chairman of Paul Weiss, could not comment on ongoing litigation, he said, but added, Alex is a person of the utmost integrity and a consummate professional. A representative for Exxon Mobil did not immediately provide comment. Bose of Reuters brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Evidence submitted by a retail union that raised objections to Amazon's conduct at this month's union election in Alabama could be grounds for overturning the vote, the National Labor Relations Board said yesterday, Wednesday. The Labor Board has overturned several union elections over the years. In 2016, the board overturned an election the United Steel Workers Union lost by a device decisive vote, a decision criticized by large U.S. business lobbies. The NLRB will hold a hearing on May 7 to project to consider objections filed by the Retail Wholesale and Department Store Union, which failed to secure enough votes from Amazon warehouse workers to form a union. The vote count announced on April 9 showed that workers at Amazon's Bessemer, Alabama warehouse rejected the union by a more than two to one margin. The evidence submitted by the union in support of its objections could be grounds for overturning the election if introduced at a hearing, the Labor Board said. The RWDSU, that is the union, submitted nearly two dozen objections to Amazon's conduct during the election, which it said prevented employees from a free and uncoerced exercise of choice on whether to create the company's first U.S. union. The union alleged that Amazon agents unlawfully threatened employees with closure of the warehouse if they joined the union, and that the company emailed a warning it would lay off 75% of the proposed bargaining unit because of the union. Amazon, which has denied the allegations, did not respond to requests for comment, because why would they? For much of its history, the NLRB has used its decision-making authority to change labor policy by establishing new precedents. The board has repeatedly overturned cases decided by prior administrations. Under the Trump administration, it overturned cases detrimental to employers, which had been decided during the preceding Obama presidency.
Well, there's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Joe. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Shayla Farzan. Every honeybee colony has its own unique scent, like a fingerprint, and bees use that scent to recognize their nestmates, basically saying, you smell like me, so I'm going to let you into the colony. But here's the mystery. If you transfer a baby bee into a new hive, not only does the colony accept it, but that bee will eventually smell like its adopted nestmates, even though they're not genetically related. This kind of got us thinking, perhaps it's not actually the genetics of the bee, it's actually the genetics of the microbes that live within the bee. Cassandra Vernier is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois. She knew gut microbes could affect the scent and communication of other animals, like hyenas. So she and her co-authors designed a series of experiments to test whether microbes also change the scent compounds coating the outside of honeybees, known as cuticular hydrocarbons. In one experiment, they fed different gut microbes to newly hatched sister bees. The bees developed distinct microbiomes, and they also produced different cuticular hydrocarbon scents. But on the other hand... If they were treated with different inoculums, they recognized each other as non-nestmates or intruders, and they attacked each other, usually in the form of biting each other. In other words, bees from the same colony did not recognize each other when they had different gut microbes. Washington University biology professor and co-author Yehuda Ben-Shahar says the microbes are changing the bees physiologically and controlling their complicated social behaviors. But he adds, this relationship is mutually beneficial for the bacteria and the bees. The bees depend on these. I mean, they have to have some of these bacteria. So the idea is that you have a system where this relationship serves the biology of both the bacteria and the host, and it gets to a point where it's obligatory. Being able to distinguish nestmates from invaders is absolutely critical, Ben Shahar says. Without that ability, bees would be vulnerable to nest parasites and to other bees looking to steal their most precious commodity, honey. And so the entrance fee must be paid, not in dollars, but in cents. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Shayla Farzan. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? 
Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, The goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy. Most people can walk to treat any underlying depression or anxiety and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. A Texas-sized voter suppression bill is pending in Texas. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The proposed voter suppression legislation targets metropolitan areas where many of the state's black and brown voters live, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin, because its provisions only apply to counties with a population of a million or more. For example, Harris County, which includes Houston, in 2020 had a 70 percent voter turnout with no evidence of fraud. One reason for the high voter participation was the availability of 24-hour voting at eight sites on one day, the Thursday before the election. That allowed people who worked late or night shifts or two or three jobs to vote. 24-hour voting worked great! So this legislation says, never again! Another reason for the high voter turnout was the 127,000 Harris County voters who used drive through voting sites because they couldn't stand in line for hours, or because of disabilities or pregnancy or health concerns or other reasons. Drive through voting worked great, so this bill says never again. Another makes it more difficult to remove poll watchers who are intimidating would-be voters. The list of racist voter suppression provisions goes on. Raising the issue, first Georgia, now Texas. And so when it comes to voting, how many states will Jim Crow take over again? The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. 
Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1946. That was the day 8,000 UAW workers at the Alice Chandler's plant in Milwaukee voted overwhelmingly to walk off the job. Close to 12,000 production and maintenance workers were on strike across the country. Workers rode the post-war strike wave as whole industries moved to peacetime reconversion. Historian Eric Fur Slocum notes that UAW Local 248 had a historically militant left-wing leadership was known for its support to housing desegregation campaigns in the city, and was a central driving force of Milwaukee's CIO Council. They had built a strong shop steward and grievance structure at Alice Chalmers and were sure victory was certain. Local President Robert Busey insisted wage increases were not at issue, but rather unresolved issues remained to be settled now that the war was finally over. Key points of contention were the company's demands to eliminate maintenance of membership agreements that guaranteed the closed shop and union dues. The company also wanted to stop paying stewards for the time involved in grievance procedures. The Alice Chalmers strike was a harbinger of things to come. Historian Martin Halpern states that the company officials played a significant role in the crafting of Taft-Hartley legislation as the strike unfolded. Alice Chalmers was on a union-busting campaign and made no small effort to red-bait union leaders for months in local newspapers. By the fall, workers at the smaller plants had returned to work, but the Milwaukee local stood firm. Area CIO workers joined picket lines in support only to be brutalized and arrested. The House Un-American Activities Committee arrived in town to investigate the strike, and the company instigated a vigorous back-to-work campaign. After 11 months, the strike was called off with no contract and 91 union leaders fired. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 49 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high nearly the same as yesterday, around 85 or so, a mix of clouds and sun, and the winds will be picking up out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour a little later today. Mostly cloudy skies tonight, then partly cloudy after midnight, lows in the mid-40s, Winds continuing out of the west northwest at 5 to 10. Tomorrow we'll see highs of around 78 to 80, with a mix of clouds and sun early, then becoming much cloudier later in the day. Winds will shift ever so subtly out of the northwest, but continuing at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon stands at 10,329 with 129 deceased and we are now in a severe lockdown once again because of these spikes. These numbers should be going up. Uh, they, They have not been updated since early yesterday. So I expect the uh, the numbers to go up a bit more since we are in a lockdown because these infections keep spiking because the usual suspects who keep whining continue not to do their civic duty. Indeed, grass pollen is rated as high outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 29 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is high at 7. Slather on the SP50. Don't question it. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.28 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. We affectionately 
refer to it as. The weather underground, indeed. London is 51 and partly cloudy. Paris is 57 and partly cloudy. Rome is 66 and partly cloudy with a flash flood warning from thunderstorms, so be careful. Kiev is 63 and fair. Kabul is 67 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 71 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 64 degrees with a light rain. Sydney, Australia is 61 and clear. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and partly cloudy with a small craft advisory on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is 68 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd, crowdsources from around the world. Sylvie Corbet and Francis de Emilio of Reuters brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Seven Italians convicted of left wing domestic terrorist crimes in the seventies and eighties, including several former members of the, of the Red Brigades, were arrested at their homes in France yesterday, Wednesday. The French presidency said a development Italy hailed as historic. The crimes for which they were convicted include the 1980 killing of a carabinieri paramilitary general and the kidnapping of a judge in the same year. The arrest followed negotiation and agreements between Italy and France after decades, during which Paris refused to act on many of the arrest warrants issued by Italy for convicted left-wing terrorists. The French presidency said new negotiations started when Macron was elected French president in 2017, but the decisive change came when Mario Draghi became Italian premier earlier this year. The seven arrested individuals had fled Italy and sought refuge abroad before they could be imprisoned to serve their sentences. Police in France, aided by Italian police, are still searching for three others who eluded arrests at their homes. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles rester Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Anonymous staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Greek far-right member of the European Parliament refused yesterday, Wednesday, to be extradited from Belgium to Greece to serve a 13-year prison sentence for being a high-ranking member of a criminal organization. Ionis Lagos had been living in the Belgian capital, Brussels, since a Greek court in October, convicted him and 17 other former Greek parliament members from the extreme right Golden Dawn Party. Extreme right is just a nice way of calling them Nazis and uh, leading a criminal organization or being members in it. Lagos was taken into custody on Tuesday after the European Parliament voted to remove his immunity paving the way for him to be sent to Athens on a European arrest warrant. He appeared before a Belgian judge yesterday morning on Wednesday. The Brussels prosecutor office said in a statement that Lagos did not accept to be handed over to the Greek authorities. The judge decided to place him in detention. 
It said the court will decide within the next 15 days whether Lagos should be extradited. Golden Dawn was founded as a Nazi-inspired group in the 80s. It saw a surge in popularity during Greece's 2010 and to 2018 financial crisis, gaining parliamentary representation between 2012 and 2019. The five-year trial was launched following the 2013 murder of rapper and left-wing activist Pavlos Fisas, who was stabbed to death by a Golden Dawn supporter. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je vais